Today's show is brought to you by homebrewsupply.com. Homebrew Supply is your one-stop shop for brew day ingredients, recipes, equipment, and more. Take advantage of everyday low pricing and everyday flat rate shipping only at homebrewsupply.com. Go to homebrewsupply.com right now and use our promo code HHH to get 5% off your order. Homebrewsupply.com. Let us help make your brew day better. Entertaining shows with content that spreads information and sparks discourse throughout the community. This is the Pearl Media Network. Using yeast nutrients, how to get clearer IPAs, a starting gravity question, and should you follow recipe or equipment guidelines? This is Homebrew Happy Hour, Episode 197. Hello and welcome to the Homebrew Happy Hour. This is the show where we supply the answers to your homebrewing questions and discuss all things related to craft beer. If you have a question you'd like us to discuss on a future episode, you can go to homebrewhappyhour.com and click on that submit a question link at the top of the page. Or now you can call or text them in by using 325-305-6107. I am your host, Joshua Steubing. Today, I'm joined by the Director of Operations at cmbecker.com calm down there mr james carlson and what, what's going on you set the mood over there the chief, the president and chief keg washer of kegconnection.com <laughs> over here mr todd burns todd what'd you do i like your lighting you look like you're in a spaceship hey <laughs> how, are, how are you you look like you're like doesn't you james it looks like that no it looks cool yeah like like uh like your elon musk over there driving teslas and oh. Living He's in the... saving money on electricity, I think. I was going to say, are you being cheap? What's up with the lights well, out? Well, it was just so bright back here. Uh, you know, it's raining here mm -hmm. pretty hard, so I just closed my window, and uh, I just turned all the lights off to set the mood. I like it. <laughs> I like it. Your lighting's actually not bad, considering, like, mine... It does look good. Sometimes I overlight, and because I'm balding, and my... Look how shiny I am with my lighting. I, Todd, I, I can actually take some pointers from you. I always actually forget. I always give Todd crap for, like, oh, uh, being a, a Luddite or a Neanderthal, and you actually, in the creative side, I mean, you you had no lighting very well. You have a, a long history of photography, right? That was my original profession was photography. So, yeah, uh, I used to spend a lot of time in a dark room and a lot of time in a studio with lighting. And so, yeah, I've done some lighting before. I also, as a child, spent a lot of time in a dark room. Uh, not anything to do with lighting or anything. I was just a very, right, right. very yeah, depressed. Your parents, a very depressed your, your child. parents locked you in a dark <laughs> yeah, room. That's say, different. I yeah. was just, I, I, you know, in the fetal position crying. Um, this is the Homebrew Happy Hour. We are, we, uh, if you're brand new to the show, thank you for joining us. If you've been around, but you haven't listened to the last couple, we've changed our format just a little bit. We have added a fourth question to every episode. And at the request of Mr. Todd Burns, we're going to kill the small talk a little bit. We're going to shorten it. Last episode, I thought, went real well. It was very well received. So if, we can, if I continue to stay on track and not digress a bunch in small talk on things that have nothing to do with homebrewing, maybe this show will grow. We'll, we're going to see where, where this goes. But before we get into the questions, we do have some official small talk, some little ones. Uh, reminder, the 200th episode is coming up. It's going to be on, we're going to live stream on Friday, October the 2nd. We haven't set a time yet. I'm going to be up there. We're going to do it from the barn, James. Uh, okay. I, I know, I mean, that's a Friday. Usually y'all can get out of the office midday-ish, right? Like, no, we, we, we can get out whenever we're, we need to. Our, the, you're talking about for the live pot. We're going to brew that day, right? Yeah, we're brewing that, a batch okay, of beer that day. Yeah, we're going to, we're going to start, we're, we'll start early. At the barn, right? We're going to brew at the mm -hmm. barn. Okay. I mean, I usually start putting the grain in about eight. Or seven thirty or something. Whoa. Okay. Okay. Well. Okay. So maybe we're gonna do. Yeah. If we're gonna start. If we're gonna start as early as you usually do, we might have some multiple things going on. Uh. But we did talk about that for doing it for members of our Patreon that we'd be in and out of live streaming for our private Facebook group that we have for Patreon members that you can find out more info at patreon.com forward slash homebrew happy hour. But I forget Todd that you're an early bird with brewing. Um. We'll, we'll accommodate. It's just. We, well, I just like to get it going because otherwise it just goes on till five or six, seven at night. So 
Yeah. Uh, you know, and typically what I like to do is collect the water. Actually, what I do is normally do is I plan on starting about seven 30 and then I do something really stupid cause I'm half asleep and then I have to <laughs> move the mash over or fix something or do this or that. And it's, I usually start about nine 30 or 10, but my intention is to start early. You always have it, good intention. Yeah. You know, I, I think it's very important this time. I'm, I'm going to, you're both going to be there, right? Yeah. Oh yeah. Yeah. Okay. I figure we'll have breakfast, get over there early and, and then uh, hopefully, you know, what I was thinking is maybe we can get that auto sparge on the, on the, on the mash before that. Oh, you know what? And I need to drill that hole and get that uh, other mounted. probes mounted in there. Well, I'll tell you what I would really like y'all to, to do though, when we brew mm -hmm. that day, if you, if y'all could try to remember to help me put the false bottom on before I pour the grain <laughs> in, that would be very, very nice. Cause I'm tired of pouring it in, having to dump it out, uh, put the false bottom in and then pouring everything back in again. It's a lot of trouble. I've done it twice now. Do you remember that and not have a three to one water ratio? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Yes. That would be great too. I mean, although, oh my gosh, you know, according to, Lorena, maybe that's the way to brew now. Who knows? Do you remember, <laughs> Todd, how about that time we filmed a brew day uh, for an Etch Strat recipe and you poured the steeping grains directly into the kettle? Do you remember that? Uh, you know, uh, we, we were going to eliminate some small talk. Maybe we should move into <laughs> questions now. <laughs> so, yes, 200th episode is coming up. Oh, we, oh I know what I was going to say. I'll I'm go sorry. No, I'm no, going to interrupt you it. yet again. I just thought about this when you were talking about the 200th episode. Maybe we need a 200th episode recipe, so a special, a, a new recipe that we brew on the 200th episode that we've never brewed before, and it's not currently on any of the sites or anything like that. We, what do y'all think about developing a, a kettle sour. A recipe for this? <laughs> a, a kettle yeah, sour. We could do yeah. a we could do a lager based. Nobody unless you want to do an ale. Uh, I, I don't know. Let's talk about it and see if we can think of something we don't. Maybe we have a hole somewhere in our recipes, New something England that we IPA. all like, or, or we could get really bad and just, and, and just all brew a Kolsch again. It's been so long. Well, you know, it's going to be a Kolsch. If it's not a special recipe, it's got to be a Kolsch. I've been <laughs> just now shouting out Kettle Sour, New England IPA. <laughs> Y'all aren't biting the troll line at all. Oh, I know <laughs> you don't want to bro brew a Kettle Sour. I'm just ignoring you. Barley wine. <laughs> but then we wouldn't be able to drink it for a long, long time. Or but you know what? We have not brewed a Kolsch in a long time. I personally you haven't. haven't brewed a Kolsch in a year, I bet. Please, y'all, sh we should only so I could have drinkable Kolsch back on my tap. <laughs> a Kolsch, you know, we haven't brewed an alt forever, too. It's a, no, we could do no, a double brew The last brew one we did was when Stefan was here. Oh, that's yeah. right. Yeah. Okay, alt. let's let's uh, let's talk about what we're going to. Absolutely. What we're going to brew. That's a great idea. So, yes, the 200th episode coming up, it'll be uh, live streamed for everyone to consume on Friday, October the 2nd. We're usually doing them on like 11 a.m. or noon. I'll get the time finalized. It'll probably depend on where we're at in the brew day. But we're going to be doing it from all of it from the barn anyway, so it won't matter if y'all have to step away at one point to go do whatever you have to do for, for the brew day. But it's all, we're, we're, I'm assuming we're going to be over there on the three-tier system. And so we can set up the podcast right there on your little countertop, Todd, like where we do yep. recipe recap and, and all that fun stuff. So yes, and if you do want to be part of the whole day stuff that we'll be live streaming in and out of, any tier of our Patreon uh, membership can get you into our private Facebook group. So if you go to patreon.com forward slash homebrew happy hour, say it again. I'll probably just say it 10 more times this episode, but that's for more information. Speaking of Patreon, our September recipe kits have been announced. You get to choose between a pumpkin ale or a dry Irish stout, which is a Guinness clone. My pop and I just brewed that. He just transferred it without me. Uh, I think he's getting impatient. He just put it into uh, the keg. And it's he's cold conditioning it. It's carbonating. Uh, I don't even know if he's gonna wait for me to, before he does his first pour. But he's very excited about having a a stout on tap. I think it's one of those things like, you know, what what what's the temperature there, guys? I know it's raining, but it's like 80, 85? 64. 64. What? Yeah, yeah, no. it's cold here. What? In my fact, I I, ju <laughs> I uh, have my sweet stout in the secondaries and. I've been kind of eyeing that already. <laughs> I was going to uh, say, but I, well, I think like, I saw it, it's 80 Milk right now. Stout. It's yeah, it's 80 here and it's still, it's raining, but uh, people are still talking about pumpkin spice latte season and all that. And in Texas, it's like, if you just, if you get a pumpkin spice latte right now and oh yeah, look at that 57 where James is living. <laughs> wow. 
So, but but I think what my dad's doing with the stout is basically like if you start brewing and drinking stout, then it somehow changes the weather and it makes it cooler. It has to. It's a law of physics that if you brew stouts, the weather has to get better. So, or cooler, I say better. It was raining cats and dogs here. And t- Todd told me y'all are having some hellacious rains up there right now. Yeah, it's come down pretty good. In fact, it was warmer when I went to work than it is right now. That's awesome. We need it though here. We need yeah. it real bad. So, yes, the September recipe kits for Patreon members at the top two tiers have been announced. You can go to patreon.com forward slash homebrew happy hour. That's the last time I'm going to say it, but you can get more information there uh, and let me know what recipe kit you want if you're in one of those qualifying tiers. So, guys, I um, we don't do this enough. I always say I'm going to do it, but we have we get feedback every episode. Most of the time it's good. Most of the time it's constructive. And sometimes it's bad, and I, those are the ones I make jokes about. But uh, last episode... When we had a question about doing all of the fermentation in a keg, we got a lot of feedback. And so I wanted to add that at the top before going into the questions, because I think especially while it's fresh, it would be nice to give some other perspective, touch on it a little, and then get into the meat of the show with all the other questions. So um, our friend Chris, who uh, a longtime viewer, and he comments on our YouTube channel a lot, he wrote, what about a floating dip tube if you really want to ferment in the keg? This would avoid the trub on the bottom and would pull from the clear beer on top. That's just the thought. And then uh, yeah, that's a great idea. Isn't that a mm-hmm. great? So I, the, I I told him in the comments there on the YouTube. You know, we've I, I say we. I don't want to speak for y'all, but I'm fairly confident none of us have used a floating dip tube or have have y'all used one before. No, because no. I don't ferment in the keg. So yeah. <laughs> okay. I had, I had thought about a floating dip tube just for clarity wise you know, in the keg. But the problem I kept running into is trying to have something float that wouldn't keep the line as it's, Yeah, and you're you're talking about doing the engineer type. I'm going to make my own. I think there are retail solutions. And then our our friend Greg Z, who also has been a a longtime uh, friend of the show, he wrote, hey, Joshua, Greg from Facebook here. I wanted to add some quick input on fermenting in corny kegs after hearing Brent's question on the latest episode. If you want to use a keg to your benefit and prevent trub, don't cut the dip tube. Instead, invest in a cheap floating dip tube. You can find them at any popular homebrew retailer for about $15 to $20. It is basically a hollow stainless ball with a pickup tube that you slip a thin inner diameter silicone hose over, and then the other end goes over a short dip tube on your liquid side, identical to the tube on your gas side of the keg. It basically draws from the top of the keg first until it gets to the bottom. I ferment all of my beers this way, and I can cold crash or not, even dry hop, then cold crash and serve, or transfer to another keg with minimal sediment. Also, Hmm. I've unexpectedly needed to move my serving kegs a few times, and I've experienced no trub in my glass. In case this ever gets addressed in the future, uh, this is a great way to solve the trub problem when fermenting in a keg, and it's even better for serving. So there we go. Real world experience. If uh, if you want to invest in a floating dip tube, uh, they seem pretty reasonably priced. But again, I think like what we had ultimately said was um, if you're going to ferment or do it all in the keg, it's probably a space saving thing or even a money saving thing. Right. Where we just we have had I've had best. I've never tried it, so I can't say I've had a better experience, but I've had great experience doing it the old fashioned way of of fermenting in a carboy and transferring it to the keg whenever it's done. Uh, I guess you would save time and you would eliminate all those factors like we talked about oxidation, whatever. But remember, guys, we also talked about, too, how oxidation is kind of I mean, it, it can happen and I guess it can happen easy, but it's not. I mean, you know. It's not something we lose sleep over because <laughs> like, people people remember go down rabbit holes of like, I got to make sure I'm doing this exactly the right way. And I don't want any kind of air ever. So I'm going to do everything in the keg, uh, which you can or cannot do. But if you do decide to do it, like Greg said, I guess a floating dip tube would be a great option. So that was our follow up from last week's episode. If you all ever uh, have applicable advice on things you hear on this show, always send it my way. We really appreciate it because we know. We are doing the show under the guise of being experts, but we're 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 kind of figuring stuff out too. <laughs> every every time we brew, it's not uh I, I that's how I feel about my brewing experience. That's why I have James and Todd on the show to answer all the expert questions or answer the questions as my experts. But if you have information that we can also share with the rest of our audience, please send it to me, Joshua at homebrewhappyhour.com. So 
decent advice, right, guys? Oh, yeah. You know, I, I, I have to chime in there. I had an experience this weekend. So my beer started foaming like crazy when all my buddies were over here on Saturday. And, you know, I am in, kind of in the keg business and <laughs> did a few articles on foaming, and I was perplexed. I might have already overserved myself a little too, to be fair, but um, I was perplexed. I couldn't figure it out that night. The next day they all left and I decided to clean my, my beer lines, you know, cause I like to clean them every two weeks. And uh, so I took everything apart, started to clean the beer lines. Well, at some point I had unplugged my controller to, to do something in the, in the kegerator and I had plugged it back into the wrong port. So I had frozen all of my kegs oh, no. and that's the reason it was foaming is cause it was uh, partially frozen. So I think everybody had uh, felt a little rough the next morning because I was basically serving them ice beer or beer that <laughs> is the much of the, much of the, uh, uh, of the water is frozen. So it ends up having more alcohol in it. So be careful to not over, to not freeze your kegs by <laughs> doing a stupid move like that so i'm really surprised you didn't find a way to blame me for it because remember that one time you unplugged your fermenter and then you you called me like three days later and yeah so because you said that thing's really loud can we unplug it and i said yes if you remind me to plug it in when we're done i don't remember that part <laughs> I, re I just remember the call three days later you didn't tell me gotcha. to, yeah you didn't tell me to plug it back in i said plug what back in the fermenter you had me unplug why do I have to tell you to plug it back in? It's here for a minute. I told you to do it. Oh, gosh. You been, you get mad. Sometimes you get real mad at me. It's uh, it's. I'm glad I work 300 miles away from here. However, I, don't ever, I never remember getting mad at you. Oh, God. I have a 13-ish year history in my brain. of <laughs> keep getting mad at me. But anyway, we do have four questions for this week's show. So we're going to get right into the questions, starting with question number one from our buddy Josh W., who used the submission form at homebrewhappyhour.com. Josh wrote in, hey, Josh and gang, first, I want to start by telling you what a great name you have. I couldn't have picked a better one myself. Lovely name. Say hello to your mother for me. I have two questions, actually. The first one deals with yeast nutrients. Is using yeast nutrients as imperative for brewing beer as it is for making wine and mead? I have read... Your most, I have read that you get most of the nutrients, uh, the nutrients yeast need from a good mash. Second question is a little more important and is as follows. My local homebrew shop is closing after 15 years. The owners want to spend more time concentrating on their other ventures, including a wonderful brewery and an artisanal bakery. Since I will now be doing 99.9% .9 of my shopping online, what kind of items should I stock up on or keep spares of? I keg, and I am an all-grain electric brewer, if that helps. Those are great questions. Uh, number two, I have a lot more to offer. So number one, I'm going to throw it to you, James. With with yeast nutrients, I mean, again, I, I hate sounding like we're beating a dead horse, but we, we always use Imperial. I, I don't use yeast nutrients beyond. And a World Flock, I'm lying. If you want to consider a World Flock tablet a nutrient, it's not, it's, not, it's for clarity. So, but yeah. I'm just saying, like that's I can't think of any time I've ever used yeast nutrients. What are your thoughts, Mr. Carlson, on yeast I, nutrients? I don't usually use them. Um, he's right. The mash pretty much creates everything the yeast need for as far as nutrients. The only thing that might possibly get me to use it if I had a really high gravity beer, and I'm going to try to get as much as I can get out of the yeast. Uh, another thing I was thinking about is that would be really good if you were going to do yeast starters. We don't really do that a whole lot because we use Imperial. Um, but if you were going to make a yeast starter, I would probably suggest using yeast nutrient because that's going to help the cells divide quicker and uh, healthier. And, you know, it's, we, we talk about cell lag or, or the uh, yeast lag, the, the point where it's not eating enough or consuming enough sugars and there's not enough numbers to create uh, the airlock to bubble or to create enough CO2, that's called lag time. Um, that could help speed that up if you were doing starters or if you have a real busy grain bill, bill, bill beer, you might want to consider doing that. But for the most part, don't use them. Yeah, so no no actual experience. Todd, I, I again, I, I love putting words in your mouth, but I don't believe you've ever used yeast nutrients either on a brew day, have you? Oh, yeah. 
Yeah, I use it on the last batch I brewed. Did you really? So <laughs> yeah, I use uh, foot and mouth. I use on. it every time I remember to pour it in there. Yeah, that's the thing is remembering. I know when we were doing Big Bertha years ago, I, that was a routine. I, I put a, a teaspoon of yeast nutrient in it. Uh, of course, you gotta understand we were doing thirty to forty gallons of beer, but you know we use that a lot. But yeah, I didn't uh, have any here for a while. Last time I brewed, I picked some up, and uh, I just you know, threw some in there just because I had it. So well, the only yeah. reason I was so confident you didn't is because of the dozen or so brew days I've been around. And even though specifically the ones we film up there, you've never used them like on any of those. Yeah, but days. Y'all, y'all mentioned the other day that I don't use world flock and I pretty much use it on every brew. So I'm not sure. Yeah. Weren't you, you didn't think I used world flock and I throw them. No, in I didn't every, say that. I don't, I don't. Oh, you didn't. Okay. I don't remember. I don't use world flock. <laughs> yeah. I mean, so I could, you know I what, Todd, that. maybe I did. You want to bet $5? I mean, I don't think I said that you don't use World Flock, but I might have, uh, and it'd be easy to find. You're probably right, but if you want to bet $5. Let's move on. <laughs> his second <laughs> part. He's not taking yeah, the yeah. bait, dude. <laughs> oh, the second part of his question, uh, first off, what a bummer. We've, I've gotten, we have heard news through through the beat of our industry that a bunch of all the brick and mortars that have had to unfortunately close shop because we're still in, in the midst of a pandemic and, and most local governments are keeping certain businesses closed and some homebrew shops are considered essential and they can stay open. But a lot of them are, ha- are having to choose to close their doors because it's already a marginally thin industry. Uh, you don't get into this industry looking to get rich. <laughs> you don't, no. it, yeah, unfortunately, but so it is a bummer, Josh, about your, your shop and, and going online is what a lot of people have been having to do anyway, if they're trying to be contactless or uh, if their shop doesn't, keep some of the certain things that they're looking for or whatnot. James, you are the man when it comes to keeping stuff on hand in my book. Like every yeah. time I, every time I've ever had a brew day issue, you're like, uh, Oh, with that, Oh, that would be resolved with some DME or whatever. Don't you have DME sure. in your freezer? Blah, blah, blah. Mm-hmm. So that's the first thing that pops in my mind. What are the necessities for a guy that kegs and brews all grain that you should always have in stock at his house? Oh, I would absolutely say base malt. So if if you use a lot of two row or pills and malt, you keep keep plenty of base malt in your freezer. Uh, DME helps add if you if you're short on gravity, you can you can boost it with a little dry malt extract. Plus, if you're doing starters, you're going to need that as well. I would also always keep in the freezer some SAO five or some dry yeast. So in case you have stuck fermentation, you can you can try to save that batch of beer. And then also, if you use a lot of certain type of hops, you can definitely do that. I know for for years I was using just Cascade, so I had uh, I kept a pound of Cascade pellets in in my freezer. So that's that would be my my advice is base malts, emergency yeast, and and hops. Todd, as a kegger and as the master kegger of this whole universe, I'm gonna say that you're gonna at least mention. Uh, a container, a tube of lube, which uh, do you already, I mean, I, I don't even have to speak now. You already know what I was going to say. <laughs> well, well, I always like to have a tube of lube around. That's what I, was gonna say. <laughs> I stole your thunder. I was it. Yeah. When I stay over there, it, sometimes it gets awkward when people who aren't in the industry are over and Todd's like, Hey Josh, pass me the lube. Oh no, we're working on kids. We're working on kids. Like, golly, is that how he keeps his job? This is weird. Um, the O-rings, right? For sure. Todd. Yep. Oh, all kinds of O-rings because I have a kinds. the three tier system, so I keep O-rings for everything that an O-ring could go out on. Um, one of my I have a I have Blickman pumps on my system, and one of them got some stuff in it the other day because of a <laughs> false bottom issue, <laughs> and um, <laughs> our lack of false bottom. And uh, so I took it apart, cleaned it real quick, and when I put it back together, I I, I actually cut the o-ring in half so i went out and i had two extra o-rings boy that was nice i would have shut me down otherwise you know I, well i would have had to run everything on one pump and and, and determine how to do that so it, it, o-rings are i think are something that you should keep spares for everything you use in o-ring lube i don't i don't keep a lot of brewing i don't really keep brewing stuff like uh like maybe some uh dme is about all I keep because I mean, I own a homebrew store. I can drive 
20 minutes and open the door and get anything I need. So I'm not the right person to ask for that. You are not. That's why I segued it to the tagging side of it, because I know for the ingredient side of it, you don't mind either asking someone from the office, hey, can you run this to me? I'm busy. Or (laughs) going, going, (laughs) James laughed because he knows it's true. That's why I got to laugh at him. (laughs) He's the one that used to go to Austin for us and pick up grain. I I mean, he would pick up 200 pounds at a time. So it, uh, that's why I'm kind of getting in my head the the ingredients to keep on hand and the hops and all of that. Oh, He's more that, oh, it's a great side idea. And, it's definitely yeah. a great idea. I just, like I said, I don't think about it that much because I, I can kind of, uh, first, I'm very, very careful when I take the recipe home to make sure I get everything. Yeah. Uh, and then if, you know, and I'm also very good about going, you know, I can always go back and get it. But, uh, you know, I, I, the things... But but we've all left something out, like a hop or a – I mean, I, I think we've all made mistakes before when we were brewing when we didn't have everything we needed, and that sucks. I, I thought you were referring to the 5-gallon versus 10-gallon batch size. <laughs> What's that? <laughs> Earlier when you were talking about it, I'm very careful to make sure my recipe is what it needs to be. Oh, it's uh, fe- it felt like Josh a jazz. It felt five gallon batches it, on a ten gallon system. It, it felt- yeah, so I I do I actually <laughs> when I get ingredients I get ingredients for like a seventeen gallon seventeen and a half gallon. So I get three and a half recipes. It, there it, you go. It, it, yeah. well, Josh J- Josh gets. <laughs> One recipe. It, it felt like a jab. About anybody else. It felt like yeah. a jab. It did feel like a jab. It's yeah. Well, because you guys typically arrange your recipes yourself. I have your people <laughs> arrange the recipes for me up there. Araceli, great employee, love her to yeah. death. And sometimes I forget to to tell her, uh, or I guess Joe, and then to her, uh, ten gallon, please. And then when I'm home and I'm in Lampasas, which is almost a halfway point, a little bit past halfway for coming home uh, that's when i realized like oh no i only took home a five gallon batch oh okay whatever and then todd charges me for the five gallon batch <laughs> then life goes on um that's a good point though that james brought up i want to circle back to a little jane people learn out of necessity like when you if you're having josh if you're having to start buying online you're going to mm-hmm. start realizing what you need more that isn't easily accessible. Like I'm just going to drive down to my local home supply shop and pick up whether that be dry yeast or the DME for me, I'm like Todd where, because I'm a recipe kit brewer, I I have, I I do have a a couple, I think we have one or two packs of Oh five that were left over that I took from other ones, but it's good to have in the freezer at my, at my pops place. Cause like you said, James, if we have stuck fermentation and sprinkle that stuff over Mm -hmm. and hopefully save it. But the equipment side, I love redundancy on the equipment side because it, like, not necessarily redundant distanets, but having the appropriate parts for a distanet if it goes out. Like the, like the connection between the, the distanet inside of a uh, MFL on the flared side to, to prevent leaking, the, the little gasket, the little plastic piece, having, mm-hmm. having plenty of those. Uh, on the regulator side, having, having the, the, you know, like Todd said with gaskets, I don't think you can have enough gaskets. Because you, just, you lost me on that gas. Uh, what gasket? The one between what? Oh, so, so he's talking about a flare washer. A which flare washer. You don't technically need one with a CM Becker disconnect because it's built no. into the end of the disconnect. Right. Oh, you know what? I did know that, but we we've always had them on the gas side because I had a leak mm-hmm. there once. And yeah, if it's a metal to metal, you definitely want to use one. But on the CM Becker, because it's, it's built in into the it. End. Right. So punch me in the face, Todd, with that look. Oh my god. <laughs> I do. And just the way he goes, I, you know what? I did know that <laughs> because, probably because of my 13 years of experience dealing well, with CMB. Well, CMB, CMB is, but you're right. We have always bought CMB even before you owned them. <laughs> even before it's you. It's all right. Uh, uh, I've done it before. I've actually put one w- w- without paying attention <laughs> and it'll still seal. It just doesn't have as many threads to grab onto. Yeah. No. And, and it's funny is because we do have them in our, in our gas side only. And only because we had one on the generator I took over there, those two gas lines have it on there because I had a gas leak there once. And I just, I, I totally forgot that it's built into it. It must've just not been tight is why I had a gas leak. Yeah. It, and, uh, cause I, when you go through one full CO2 cylinder in a couple of days, I got paranoid and, and just made sure to cover all my bases. But back to what I was saying, Todd, having redundancy of parts on my equipment is is nice to have because if you have equipment failure it's not as easy to go like uh can you go get the appropriate size gaskets from a home depot or a hardware shop 
around you for for a corny tag? Uh, not the big disc, not the you big dip right? tube. Yeah. You might be able to find dip tubes. You know, dip dip. Uh, you know, not dip tubes. I'm saying dip tubes. I mean, uh, lid O rings. O rings. Most hardware stores do have an O ring section, and and you might be able to find stuff that fits. You know, actually, it's funny you say that because the larger O ring that goes on the outside of the post on on uh, kegs. Just so you know, everyone. If you're using a CO2 cylinder and you have a, I'm sorry, if you're using propane and you, and you, uh, you need that little O-ring that goes on the end before you screw it onto the propane tank. Uh, I just happen to know that the, the O-rings from keg post work for that as well. So, wow. I o- didn't know that. Yeah. O-rings, you know, O-rings, uh, you should be able to find O-rings at a hardware store. Not the big one though. That's virtually impossible to find. Right. And that's what I mean. So having, having, and packs of O-rings, well, first off, when you buy a used keg from Keg and Etch and it comes with an extra pack. So you have a, you have O-rings that already work on your keg and it comes with an extra pack, but packs of O-rings are cheap. There's no reason not to have a ton of them. <laughs> I say oh, a ton. They're super they're cheap. So and, you, cheap. and really most people that have a problem with a keg leaking, a lot of times it's those post O-rings. So you yeah. get a little crack in them. And they leak out or one of them breaks and your gas all leaks out. I mean, it's not worth a few pennies to not just, if you're not sure at all, just replace them and keep them lubed all the time. So Absolutely. And and yeah, back to the lube. I, one tube of lube goes a long way. It's nice oh, to have yeah. that lube. And, uh, and and sanitation stuff. I will say, I, I choose to use the BTF Iota 4 from our... Uh, uh oh goodness national chemicals national chemical. yeah, thank you yeah i was, had a brain fart this whole episode's been a brain fart uh the i my pop loves it you i know you you like it but it stains stuff and so that's been your complaint on it but um having sanitation ha- having a sanitizer and even having like the brew clean plenty on hand is also important because of not having to wait to do your cleaning and sanitizing which you have to i mean you will always need sanitizer for a brew day or a transfer day or a kegging day. I can't think of a day that involves besides just pouring and drinking day. I can't think of any day related to brewing where you don't need sanitizer. So having plenty of sanitizer as well is a good thing, but Josh, thank you so much for submitting that question. Moving on to the second question of the show, which was uh, submitted by our buddy Robbie in who also used the submission form at homebrewhappyhour.com. Robbie wrote, I'm having some problems getting the perfectly clear beer for my West coast IPAs. I use high flocculating yeast and even whirl flot tablets at 10 minutes. I can get clear lagers in other beers, but my IPAs always seem to get a slight haze. Could it be that could it be because I use a lot of hops? Would I benefit from using something like Biofine, Biofine, pardon me, or some sort of clarification product in my spike conical? I usually am cold crashing for 3 to for 3 days at 38 degrees. Robbie, um well, I don't brew a lot of IPAs. James, you don't brew a lot of IPAs. Todd, <laughs> yeah, <or> asking me. <laughs> so that's why, so Todd, um, I, I think I can ha- I think I can handle most of the questions there. Uh, first and foremost, he, you mentioned the whirl flock that you put it in at ten minutes. My understanding is that whirl flock should be in five minutes or less before the end, or or it loses effectiveness. So I would add it at five minutes, or you know don't leave it in more than five minutes before flame out. So that's, that's the first thing I would say. Um, as far as the clarification on, on the IPA, you know, some IPAs are not going to get as clear as others, if, depending on when you add the hops and how you add the hops, but, uh, or even how many, how much hops you right, that can I, really I, affect it. Did, did, did he mention, uh, in the question, how long he he was uh, cold crashing for? He did at the end. He said he usually cold crashes for three days at thirty eight. Okay, uh, yeah. I, our rule of thumb around here on cold crashing is we don't really see total clarification until about three weeks. Uh, we yep. we almost always cold crash at least two weeks. Uh, now I understand IPAs. You want to drink them as fresh as possible. Um, so there's a little bit of a dilemma there, but if, if to really, really clarify a beer, I think, I don't think three days is enough time. Uh, mm-hmm. I don't think you're going to see much. Two weeks, two weeks won't do it. All. Right. Uh, so you need more time. Yeah. And did I cover everything? 
Well, he also, um, so yeah, he's using high flocculating yeast, so we can mark that, you know, check that on That's the good. bots. That's yeah. good. Uh, the whirl flock, you know, it's funny, you, you say five minutes or less. I want to say a lot of people, including a lot of the recipes I've brewed, say 15. Mm -hmm. you, can, you can throw it in at 15. Uh, if you read the package from Whirl Flock, it'll say five. I'm pretty sure it says five minutes or less. You want to bet $5? Uh, sure. <laughs> wait, no, wait, hold on, hold on, hold on. Wait a second. Let, let's clear the bet. Are you, you, are you saying it's bet? Like, is the claim that you made, because here's what I got from you, that the Whirl Flock tablet is ineffective if you put it in at 15 it's, minutes? It's less effective if you leave it in too long. You should do it five minutes or less. Okay, I don't know about that. I don't know if I want to bet that. We'll at, we'll at, at boiling. So what you're yeah, saying is right. at boiling, it's less effective if it stays in the boil longer. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. It starts to lose its effectiveness. I, I throw mine in at flame out now. How about that? Uh, okay. <laughs> we, no, I don't. Okay. <laughs> Just bounced right off you. No, yeah. Everyone's getting to their Google machines right now. I'm going to find out. Uh, we'll come back on that bet, Todd. But yeah, he... he uh, he didn't okay, specify. Here, here we go. This is oh, off goodness. of, uh, I don't know if, here we go. well, I mean, that's what people are saying the same thing, but I'm getting different times on here. We, we'll have to, we'll have to go to world flock and get an actual answer from world flock or I say world flock, whoever makes, yeah, whoever say you keep, you keep using it like it's Kleenex or ping pong. <laughs> No, we're going to call a, you're such an old man. We're going to call up world flock and get to the bottom of this. That's what we're going to do. <laughs> Who is world flock, Todd? It, well, it's a, it, it's, it's a, I mean, the company makes it. It's, no, obvious. it's not, yes. yeah, I know. Well, it, it is a pro, I mean, in world flock, just literally like processed, um, Irish moss. And is that what it is? Or substitute for it. Or, or right, alternative. Sure. Right. Yeah. Yeah, well, as you get to that, I will segue this for more of the questions so people aren't just scratching their ears right now. Um, I've never used uh, something like, like Biofin, and I've never even used like gelatin. James, for clarity, is mm -hmm. time your best friend, or do you like to I use? think so. Okay. I think that if you can keep it cold, well, we, you can cold uh, crash it and leave it cold for three to four weeks. It'll drop out clear. And I, you know, even though IPAs aren't our, our, our your and mine favorite style, right. I will say I like presentation like a, like he, like a West a good West Coast IPA with clarity mm -hmm. seen through it. Maybe it's a placebo effect going on in my brain, something psychological. With a good presentation, it always seems to taste better too. And I know again that that's not scientific, right? But like, sure, no. When, it, it, a good example would be one year hunting season started. I brewed some beer for Todd. And uh, it was good beer. It just wasn't, it was, it was fairly young. So it wasn't as clear as it should be. And, you know, uh, there was a good bit of people made comments about that's not the most appetizing looking thing to drink. And I tend to agree with him. So after that, I focused more on, on trying to produce a lot clearer beer before I wasn't really concerned about it. Cause I was, my thought was if it tastes good, then that's, what's the most important thing. But presentation is absolutely important. Right. And and like you said, ultimately, like, because don't get me wrong, I've, I've had some very beautiful looking clear beers that probably weren't very good uh, on an objective scale, but yeah. it looked good for Instagram. And that's what really matters for me. But <laughs> Oh, it's got to have that post. I got to have that post. Yeah, people weren't. <laughs> Here's what's funny. I posted that photo and, and I swear on my life, guys, I'm not making this up that the, the cream ale my dad and I brewed turned out phenomenal. I think it is mainly because cream ales are hard to mess up, but Thank the Lord we didn't mess it up. But some people had private messaged me on our Instagram when I posted that photo and like, yeah, it looks good. How's it taste? Like you can be honest with me. I was like, you jerks, you jerks. It do it does taste good. I it went for losing, right? <laughs> yeah, but you're right. Ultimately, y'all y'all have no idea. I could have just been choking it down or just poured it right after. But it did look pretty. It was a great photo. But um, I understand, Robbie. W regardless of the style, even though I'm not brewing a whole lot of IPAs these days, uh, getting clarity is good who doesn't like a bright beer I, oh yeah right and i'm preaching yeah i'm preaching to the choir here on this show <laughs> like we love bright <laughs> beers he, todd too todd's been the king of bright beers lately you're you're uh, uh all, all the beers you've had on tap oh i guess that lemon drop was james which was phenomenally mm -hmm. bright i mean like seeing my whole hand behind it kind of bright and then todd you're even your uh your grapefruit ipa it, it was like carbonation was perfect it was bright do you do you still have some on tap? Because you know I'm coming up tonight. Uh, so 
Yes, it it was one of the <laughs> ones that froze, and I can't remember. It's about done, but I do have it in bottles. Oh yeah, I can't wait to drink your beer. It's going to be a great night when pe- by the when people are consuming this show. I'm going to be plastered on your patio with my guitar singing friends in low places with you again. Oh, uh, good. I can't wait to sing that again. <laughs> so that'll be fun. Robbie, thank you so much, my friend, for submitting your question. We're halfway through the questions, and so it's a great time to remind you that when you submit a question and we take it on air, we give you a $25 gift card to TedConnection.com, courtesy of Mr. Todd Burns. Thank you, sir, for your generosity and support of our show. Moving on to question number three came from our friend John, who also used the submission form at homebrewhappyhour.com. John wrote, hey, love the show, and I've learned a lot in the short few months that I've started homebrewing. I have two questions about the Target OG, which stands for Original Gravity. In the recipes, are they truly a Target, or should you be getting exactly the OG stated, and would using less water raise the OG? Thanks, John. James, I can tell you from personal experience because I I get uh, very anxious over making sure our numbers are right. And when I say it, me, yeah. my dad. So like, let's say for instance, yours says a starting gravity of of ten thirty five, and mm-hmm. we're ten thirty four. He freaks out. He's a whip. Okay. <laughs> it's a bust. It's a bust. The brute is a bust. And same with and same with the final yeah. gravity. We're like, oh, it's gonna be ten ten, and like we did it. It's like ten eleven and some change. He's mm-hmm. like, oh, well, I don't know what we did. I don't know what, we, what did you do. You know, it's, he sounds like Todd. He sounds <laughs> like, like Todd. Todd with thermometers. It's right? Todd with <laughs> thermometers exactly. So so first off, can you at least maybe alleviate some of the like when you're making a recipe or or, mm-hmm. or is it a huge emphasis like this is the number you better hit. When no, absolutely not. And that's one of the misconceptions people have that, you know, that don't take it too literal. We, I think we calculate all our gravities based on 70% efficiency. So um, if you got a machine that does that consistently higher, then you're going to get a higher gravity reading than if somebody that can only get 60. But uh, it's, it's relative. You want to get into the ballpark, I would say, if you're looking for four and a half percent beer you're going to be up or down a little bit depending on your system you can always add water or boil it down to where you want to hit it but it's not a written in stone wouldn't you agree todd oh yeah it's rare to hit it exactly i mean uh, there's too many variables particularly equipment i mean uh, our what we brew on tends to be a lot more efficient than some of our recipes so a lot of times our problem is not under, but over. We we go over a lot, and then uh, you can almost always compensate. I just add some RO water at the very end, mm-hmm. uh, and either e- even uh, typically I add it right as on flame out, so you're still adding it to boiling water, and uh, I think you're going to kill pretty much. And if there was anything in the RO water, which there shouldn't be, I think you're going to kill it anyway. I mean, you know, we we brewed extract forever when part of the recipe was to add tap water, you know, right at the end. The, yeah. In the fact, tap, I would so. put two gallons in the freezer and let it get super duper cold. Yeah. And then I would cut my chill time in half by just adding that. And I would be at 70. So, yeah. yeah so it's, it's, it's very, very common to add or subtract, you know, you can subtract by boiling longer, which you, you know, you can run into some issues if you, if you boil too long, because you're, you're on a hop schedule and everything like that. But, uh, you know, for the most part, don't, don't, I wouldn't worry about it too much. Well, yeah. and, and like you said, though, if you using less water will bump up the, the original gravity, correct? Yeah. Yeah. And like y'all said, if you're trying to bring it down, like y'all have done, what was the last brew day? Wasn't it that brew day that we did the spike solo where y'all had to boil down to, to get to your numbers? Mm. Yeah, yeah. For some reason, that particular brew day, we were way off on efficiency. Um, I think I had to boil it down to thirteen gallons on a was, fifteen gallon batch. I was off when I my, on my last batch when I brewed the uh, sweet stout. I was off, uh, and I, I'm not going to hit the alcohol because my final gravity wasn't where I wanted it to be. Uh, so, you know, it, my alcohol will probably be. I don't remember what I said now, maybe four. closer to four and a half than the yeah. five, somewhere Boy, between good, four though. and a half and five, but it tastes great. And mm-hmm. you know, I don't, I mean, it's, it's going to be, as long as it tastes good, I don't really care. 
Well, and that, that's what I was going to get to with you guys, because I know um, when you're like for competition's sake, they don't they have they're assuming like is, is ABV part of the criteria on, on like if I submitted my thing for Kolsch and, you know, the uh, Kolsch range is what, like four point. Well, they, they don't test for it. That's what I mean, I'm, that's what I, well, that's what I'm alcohol saying. Alcohol by volume test. They're going to their palate. You know, right. That's yeah, that, they're right. going to use their palate. Yeah. That's what I mean. So it, um, being exactly on your numbers is rare in my experience, but I'm open to the possibility that me and my dad just aren't good brewers but my but also anecdotally in the bubble that i'm a part of our great community and our patreon group uh all of our listeners that contribute questions and then the the reddit which is slowly accepting me into their tribe uh (laughs) it seems like people have a shared experience of like yeah I'm, i'm in the ballpark but and it tastes good i'm happy it's not like uh i think it's a very idealistic or even romantic uh, you're like ro- you, you romanticize like i'm gonna okay the recipe says this is the og i do all this boom oh i hit it ha it's right on the dot like that doesn't happen a whole whole lot but but there are yeah but when it happens you're all like wow i hit my exactly hit my numbers so well, it, yeah yes. it's kind of exciting when you hit them. when it does happen i put on my lab coat i put on my glasses and i i, I do the meme where you know i'm something of a scientist myself <laughs> because, because otherwise we yeah exactly they, when when we hit our numbers it's like oh it's because of what we did and when we don't hit our numbers it, me and my dad are like oh, what, what that something, recipe's wrong yeah that recipe was wrong <laughs> yeah, who did this? Who did this? So this is Joe's no or Lorena. Lorena's recipe is wrong because our system was a number short. Uh, thankfully, like like I said, what is okay in y'all's opinion? When do you become concerned? Five points, give or take. Four points, give or take. It, like when when does it become an issue to where like oh we got to do something? Well, yeah, I mean if you're off by five points, that's that's, that's, a that's huge, quite a bit. Yeah. 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 So if if the recipe called for ten fifty and we can't get anything close to ten fifty, like it's in the ten forties, then I look at what's what's going on. You know, check yeah, the temperature. No. Usually, if well, I don't know about Todd, but I had an issue one time where I just couldn't seem to hit the gravity in it. Come to find out, I was five degrees off, so I was in the beta range, which normally it produces really fermentable sugars. It just doesn't produce produce as much. And that also yeah. can be detected in the body as well. Interesting. And I didn't consider that either because, you know, uh, this is this is digressing, but it's on top. It, so don't tune out yet, listeners. Uh, we have had like with that foundry it is uh, was it five degrees off or six degrees off to where after we brew, which again, knocked on wood, the cream ale though turned out great. We, we were our numbers were a little off, but then it made sense afterwards when we realized, wait a second. It's showing 207 and it's boiling. I'm not really a scientist or very good at math, but water doesn't boil at 207. And so we realized yeah. that, oh crap, it's five degrees off. Like, you know what? Well, when, it, you, when you notice that when you're like, we didn't notice the it during the, we didn't notice it during the mash. That, that's the part where it, it well, what happened when you put your thermometer in there to check it? Oh my God. <laughs> okay. Okay, Mr. Smarty Pants McGee, l- listen. Yes, we didn't. We didn't include. Well, what if our other thermometer wasn't calibrated appropriately? Th- then what? It just the whole day could have been a cluster. You don't have a uh, clinically calibrated thermometer <laughs> that you could check your other thermometers with. I the, mean, I don't. I don't understand. I don't. Of course, you don't understand, jerk. <laughs> He's probably got an extra one he you can you can borrow off of. I do have an extra one, yes. <laughs> but for when he breaks, says James, do you think I don't look for stuff to steal out of his barn every time I'm up there? <laughs> like Todd, look over there, <laughs> putting stuff in my button up. That's why I wear Hawaiian shirts. It's easy to slip stuff in. He thinks he getting... definitely was a Boy Scout because he's always been prepared. <laughs> he has always been. That day that right. we did the presentation for Homebrew Con, I forgot the uh, the barb pieces for the for the tail pieces i don't know if y'all remember that i don't i was able to scrounge enough for six faucets <laughs> out of some of the stuff he had and i would have bet i was going to drive 40 uh, miles okay to get first on. off before Boy we start scout or pack rat? i'm gonna say yeah. thank you todd before we start buttering him up he's a hoarder <laughs> no he i'm telling you he is not he is prepared because when he started brewing at, at his house he made right. a point to come in, and he said, "Okay, well, I know I'm going to need this. I'll need extra." I'm telling you, man. Yeah, you're right. I've never seen somebody that, that's so prepared 
No, no, no. You're Todd. no, you're right. Todd Todd does have a lot of redundancy. Go, going impressive. back to one of the first questions. <laughs> yes, we. I would like to give him credit and say it's intentional, but whether it is or isn't, it's there. We know that for a fact. <laughs> well, as soon as it's like my my soon to be in eight more days, eighty six year old father has drilled into my head since I was a little kid. Prior proper planning prevents piss poor performance. <laughs> that's right, man. We gotta have your dad on the show. That's we what should. we. That's what yeah. we need to do. That's great. We need to do a brew. Is there any chance we can get him over there on the two hundredth episode for the live sure, brew day? I'm sure. Yeah, he'd love it. He'd uh, get a kick out of it. Let's do that because your your dad's one of the coolest people I know, and he uh, he's actually. I'm totally digressing off topic, but I'm just excited about this. We've been. He's been recording his book. Because we're going to eventually, at some point, publish it through Audible or on the Amazon yep. platform, I guess the, the, the one and the same. And uh, I've been editing it in my free time, which is to say I'm not working right now for Todd. I'm just editing this audiobook. <laughs> and uh, you're, you, <laughs> you didn't laugh. That makes this awkward. I'm, uh, no, I, I started on the weekend. And you could tell your dad's really into it. I'm excited about it. I, I like that. I like having the author read their book because I think that they get more. Or they... they uh, they convey more rather like your dad knows what he wrote and how he was feeling when he wrote it. And he's able to convey that. I mean, I'm just excited that you're editing my dad's book instead of playing video games during the day while I pay you. I think it's a much better. Actually. <laughs> you're right. It is more productive. Yeah. I mean, yeah. Yeah. yeah my, my level 34 uh, dwarf priest really needs some nutrient right now or nurturing, but uh, <laughs> I will uh, get back to him later. But yeah. So John, uh, relax. Don't worry. Have a homebrew. Right. Like your numbers, if you're you're in the ballpark, you're doing good. And I think most importantly, when it tastes good, you you did good. Even if, uh, oh, it's a little low on the ABV. You know, my dad and I had have had issues before where we brewed a a severely uh, low ABV alt and it tasted fantastic. We're like, oh, it's a session alt and we can just drink more of it now. Hallelujah. Right. (laughs) Like not drink more of it without a headache. But yeah, don't stress too much on the numbers. But if you if you need more elaboration or if you have more uh, info that you want elaboration, you can email Todd or James at any time. They'd be happy to Absolutely. help you figure out what's going on too. If you're having real bad gravity uh, or o- getting to near the ballpark of the OG. But anyway, moving on guys to our last question, our fourth and final for this week's episode came from our buddy Ruben, who also used the submission form at homebrewhappyhour.com. Ruben wrote, Hello, I recently bought an Anvil Foundry 10.5 gallon system, and I watched your video. I watched your video of the brew day using this system. My question is: once I choose a recipe from one of the many books that have them, should I use the Anvil table recommended strike water amounts and sparge amounts, or should I use the amount of strike and sparge amounts that the recipe books list for the recipe? The numbers are different, although the final amount that will be boiled are the same, which is 27 liters. What numbers do you recommend I use? I'll give you an example. The anvil instruction sheet shows that for a 13-pound grain bill at 6.2 gallons of strike water is required and one gallon added for sparging. But the recipe in the book for the American IPA shows that 13 pounds of malt, the mashing I should use, four gallons of water, and a starting to boil, and and then for starting to boil, I will have 7.2 gallons. Thank you and greetings from Mexico. I am a big fan of your videos, Ruben Martinez. We're we're I want to first point out we're very inter- oh, that's cool. We're very international. We're very international friendly. The people in this world they know our show. We're the best show. We do the homebrew. We're the best. They love us. I know people. The sorry, Todd. I, that was my. I'm so bad at a Trump. I'm so bad at Todd. Usually giggles when I try to do Trump, but that was really bad. But we we do. I get questions so many a lot from Australia. Uh, we gotta go to Australia, and I've been trying to get Todd to take us to Mexico for. We have friends in Caretaro who uh, uh, are part of the uh, Brewers Association type of organization there. They invite us every year. Not this year because there's a pandemic. I don't know if y'all heard, but they, they've been wanting us to get down there. But anyway, Ruben, thank you for submitting your question. This First off, the Foundry, my dad is a believer now that uh, we've been brewing on it. It is a phenomenal piece of equipment, really good. But this is like a question my dad would ask because he's a nerd. And he reads every piece of literature that comes with everything we use. The foundry, the recipes, anything he can find online. James, I'm going to throw it to you mm-hmm. first. If if there's a big discrepancy, which I don't think there should be, which one yeah. are you trusting first? The equipment instructions or the recipe instructions? I would probably lean towards the equipment instructions. And let me tell you why. 
a lot of times when they're giving these numbers, they're not going high water to grain ratio. And you got to understand that with those all in ones, you need a higher, I would, I would recommend me personally, I would say you need to be 1.5 to one water to grain ratio. And that's that, what that does is it promotes the flow through the machine. So if you try to do it any thicker, a thicker mash, you're liable to get a stuck mash. Uh, we've run into that before. So I would always go with the manufacturer first. Once you use the machine, you'll get to know what the best water to grain ratio is. I would always recommend going thinner. Mr. Burns, you brew predominantly on systems that you and James build. <laughs> so you, I don't know uh, how much technical writing Mr. Carlson does for you, but what we're assuming, oh, no, you have the spite system at the office. When yeah. You made people write their own instructions on using it. Did you and make them include for brew day instructions like this or just using the equipment? Like who, what do you trust? Would you entrust the instructions from the equipment manufacturer first or, or do you just follow the recipe guidelines? Yeah. yeah I mean, the equipment manufacturer is going to know the, the best for their, you know, for their equipment, but there's also some influence from the recipe as well. I mean, if you're, if you're brewing a recipe that say has a lot of oats in it or what's another one, James, uh, something that's going to clump flake. up. Like, yeah, uh, you know, yeah, any corn kind of, or rice. Yeah, flake corn. Even then, rye. I mean, yeah, you know, yeah. anything that doesn't, or wheat that doesn't have a hull or a husk to use as a filter bed. That's why you add rice husk in a lot of times mm -hmm. is, to, is to give it a better filter bed. But you also may want to use a, a higher ratio of water. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, I've, I've brewed from everything from 1.25 to, to 2 ratio. And I mean, I, I think you can get a good beer out of any of them. It's just, I, I typically, uh, for, as a general rule of thumb, I do 1.5. Uh, That's what I use. So, and that works for good for all-in-one machines like the Anvil Foundry, the Grainfather. Uh, it also works good with what we're using, the three-vessel harm system. I did do one that was closer to two the other day, but that was completely due to the fact that I couldn't read. So... <laughs> Well, I think we did a four to one. Yeah. Uh, one day. <laughs> we did. Wow. We Which, did. Well, we just come out really good too. But yeah, we, we had, we, what we had done is we'd filled the, uh, we were, you know, we had hot water in, in the hot liquor tank in, in the mesh ton. And we, we were, we meant to take it all over to the hot liquor tank and bring it down to where we wanted it. And we just kind of forgot before we poured the grains in. So we, <laughs> yeah, we poured the grains in. Went, yeah. And we went, wow, that's full. Oh, shit. We just poured all those grains into 18 gallons. Of was there drinking involved? What time of the day was this? No, it was no. in the morning. We were just talking. <laughs> yeah, we were talking, not paying attention. We poured the grains, just like I do when I don't put the false bottom in, you know. I love it. So, Todd, you, you, you humanize yourself to us, uh, or us plebs, and it feels good. It feels I screw good. up all the time. <laughs> All the it's time. how we learn, right? It is how we learn. Yeah. And I, I want to. And it's a. It's shocking, shocking how many times I have screwed up brewing and came out with a fabulous beer. That's what I was going to yep. say. James just said that too when on you know, little four to one day. How it, it turned out great. It, it yeah. all it all worked out. And I also want to bring up what James is talking about. Uh, or it kind of been a theme throughout the show, like uh, with one of the other questions with your system and efficiency. Uh, you're going to get a feel for what you're brewing on. And, and in my opinion, that's one of the beautiful things about brewing on the same, like, like dialing in either your cooling, your cooler brew, like the Idlu style system or a three tier, mm -hmm. like you're more than likely you're brewing on the same kind of vessel every brew day. And the more you brew on it, the more you dial in knowing. Oh yeah, like, absolutely. And, and, and then it becomes more of a, of a feel than it does necessarily a, a an indexed book written thing. Right. You know what I mean? Like, yeah, that, you get to, you get to learn more what's important and what is not so important. Well, and yeah, so it, it's, it helps to, uh, well, also it helps you when you're developing it, like we're yeah. doing right now, we're developing equipment. I don't know if you remember, James, we used too small of fittings on my system at first. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, and, and we and, couldn't and, figure out why the system was so slow circulating. Well, you, you two was, things, you yeah. know, if you remember it, 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 it took a long time to, to ramp up temperature. So we couldn't yeah. do any step mashing and two, it just, the volume wasn't there. Yeah. We, we weren't flowing enough through. We ended up putting bigger fittings and bigger hose on. In fact, Eric and I brewed an ESB on that one time, and 
you know, afterwards it turned out, talk about, uh, you know, brewing and making mistakes and coming up with a good beer that ESP, if y'all remember, was just an excellent beer. Everybody loved it. Mm -hmm. And, and somebody asked me, so how did you brew this? Like, what was your secret on this? I was like, well, I stuck the mash for about 20 minutes and didn't get it to move at all. (laughs) And then I threw some more water in and I stirred it really hard. And (laughs) yeah, like, we're never going to be able to duplicate that. Right. Was that also (laughs) side note? Was that the time Eric dropped my camera? Was that the same day? Was that that same brew day? Oh, no, no, no. That was different. <laughs> okay. Because <laughs> Eric, I don't know if he listens to this show anymore. He was our, remember, Eric was our first question. I didn't take it on air because it was a stupid question. But it was, <laughs> he was the first person to submit a question. <laughs> and uh, if you're listening to this show, Eric, I, I, I saw the video. I know what you did to my camera. I saw it, man. I'm sorry. Well, you know, and don't forget also, I we that day Stefan was down and we were doing an alt beer. I forgot to put the dark malt That's in. That's right. I mean the yes. the really dark malt, the Carafa yes. two or the <laughs> Munich two. I can't remember. Well, you, you didn't need to. We were we were brewing, brewing a uh, blonde solid. <laughs> yeah, so. and it turned out to be a really decent tasting beer. It was yeah, real. So. Look, I, yeah, and I don't I don't want to. Uh, I, I I think you already know that most of us feel like that was one of the best alts you've ever brewed. Like it was really, it was really good. close. Uh, and we need to mention Stefan and the beer we helped them brew in Dusseldorf. He, he said the people went nuts over it. In Dusseldorf using our alt recipe, yep. all the Germans in Dusseldorf that were at this party were like, this alt beer is incredible. That's yeah, awesome. They, hey. He went on and on about how everybody was impressed at how good it was. They think they think they drunk, they drank the whole five gallons that day. They did the whole five gallons. Yeah. I believe yeah. it because I've seen Stefan throw back two pork knuckles. So why couldn't he throw back five gallons of beer? If well, he there could... were a lot of people there to be fair. Oh, well, oh, oh, oh. I can't think of the guy's name. We brewed with it. Jerry, so, Jerry, Jerry, yep. such a great oh, okay. guy. Really good guy. He's very, uh, engineer type mind and, and German brew Whoa. that day. It was a lot of fun. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It, now, yeah, and i tell you what, I was really nervous. You know, I was really nervous. I knew we were over there brewing and all that, but how it turned out, I thought mm, this will be the test for sure. Did ha- has he brewed since? Has Stefan brewed since? Do you know, Todd? You keep up uh, with him more than I, I don't do. know. I don't know. Yeah, that's another he's guy. He's got a Coles kits, but I don't know if he's brewed it. Y'all I don't gave know if he's comfortable y'all enough. gave Stefan the Coles kit. That's both. He that's likes one, them both. Yeah. Oh, uh, well, the first the first time he ever came on the show was when Todd was over there one time. And the, I still have the sound clip somewhere. I'll have to play it on here where he goes, uh, Alt is beer. Kosh is not beer. Be, be just, <laughs> and and I, I feel like, unfortunately, I'm probably just a huge disappointment to him because, uh, first off, Todd, what are you sending me chats for? It's ending up on the, <laughs> yes, yes, they work. They're popping up now. Oh, the I like it because if, if you start screwing up, I could just make a comment. Here. No, because then it pop- no, the pop- it, okay. I'm not editing this out because I'm lazy and, and I'm not editing out the part earlier where I didn't know about CMB distance, even though I've been around <laughs> them for over a decade. Uh, Todd is using the chat function on zoom to interrupt the podcast with asking me, does this work? You schmuck. It is messing up the video. I didn't know. That's what that why, why is it. Why is it mess up the video? Cause it pops up on the actual video. Like they're doing right. Th- and then no, James it, says, too. Pri- it says privately. <laughs> no, but it pops up on my I just pop mine up. Everyone. Uh, you are, you're in, it was Todd. First off, that's not how you spell your you idiot. Uh, anyway, back on the topic of the show. Uh, <laughs> I, I, man, I'm losing it. You're, you're making me lose it. So, so let's wrap up Ruben's <laughs> questions, you jerks. So you would say, uh, in the beginning, it's good to follow the manufacturer of the equipment's tables because they know their equipment more than a generic recipe might. But as time goes, you're going to learn your system and you're going to learn it with Todd, I hate you. Quit sending me messages that saying I'm an idiot and spelling your wrong. There's an apostrophe and an R and an E. No, I put you are an uh, idiot this time. And then James, That's correct. And then James is validating you. <laughs> oh, God. I'm, I'm losing it. I'm lo- this is what we have to do to get this to be an hour-long show? <laughs> I'm glad you showed me that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, as the admin of the Zoom, I'm gonna have to disable chats from every episode going forward now. And then it, you t- Todd's just gonna start texting me on my phone. Hey, you're still an idiot. <laughs> so yeah, send emojis. It, so yeah, so yes. To wrap this up, 
follow follow the instructions for for your gear. The recipes shouldn't be that big a discrepancy, but over time you're going to figure out your gear. You're going to dial it in regardless of if it's a single vessel like he's using the foundry, a three tier yeah. Herms, a cooler brew, or or whatever equipment you're using, you will dial it in. I can promise you that. Yeah, and, and after a while, you'll get used to using how it, you'll yep. know how your machine acts and the efficiency you'll get out of it. And you can tweak the recipe. In it's, the water, exactly. It's, it's, it's all good. And tweet, that's what we do. Exactly. Was, that's thank you. Yeah, we, tweaking it is is what nine out of ten people end up having to do, just because no system's efficiency is the same. And unless yeah. you did the recipe yourself with some software to tell it the exact efficiency that you think you're hitting, you're always mm-hmm. going to have to do some kind of tweaking. If again, if you're stressing about hitting the numbers exactly on the button from the recipe, but. Uh, when you yeah, start... it's not a static number, though. Correct. So people Thank don't you. realize that. Exactly. Right. Exactly. It's not a static number. And that's why I backed over to John's question earlier, why we don't stress so much when we're in the ballpark, but not on our numbers exactly, because it's not super common unless you did the recipe yourself for the system you're brewing on. Then you should mm-hmm. be like, oh, no, I didn't hit my numbers. What I do wrong. If you're in the ballpark with a generic recipe on whatever system you did, that's not calibrated specifically for that recipe or vice versa. Uh, yeah, you'll be in the, the easiest way to look into it is this way. If you pull up a BJCP guideline book, they don't have static numbers in there. They have a range that you want to be in and think about it the same way when you're brewing, you want to be in that range. So it's, it's exactly, all good. exactly. It's all good. And, and again, like Charlie says, relax and don't worry, have a homebrew unless it's bad. Then don't have a homebrew. Go buy some Kolsch, some <laughs> fru Kolsch. It's available at most major liquor stores. All right, guys, that is this week's show. Uh, thank you for annoying me, Todd, with the chat function that you just discovered 59 minutes or whatever into our show. That That's really helpful. I'm glad you're an adult about this. Uh, Mr. Carlson, they t- <laughs> you spelled your wrong again. <laughs> I know. I did that to bother you. Mr. Carlson. Seems like it worked. Thank you so much, guys, for y'all's time. Thank you for, uh, I'm going to, I'm going to actually, by the time people are listening to this, I'm not joking. We're going to be drinking on Todd's porch <laughs> with my guitar, probably singing friends in low places. So with that being said, thank you guys so much for joining me and I'll see y'all soon. See ya. Thanks. Bye. And that will do it for this episode of the homebrew happy hour. If you have a question you would like us to discuss on a future episode, you can go to homebrewhappyhour.com and click on the submit a question link at the top of the page. Or now you can call or text them in or text them in by using 325-305-6107. Thank you to our show sponsor, homebrewsupply.com, for supporting us and the homebrewing community. You can go to homebrewsupply.com right now. Use our promo code HHH and get 5% off your order. You can get even better discounts when you join our Patreon by visiting patreon.com forward slash homebrew happy hour. On behalf of Todd Burns, James Carlson, and the Pearl Media Network, I'm Joshua Steubing. Thank you for listening. This program is made possible by the Checkbook of Mr. Todd Burns and by contributions to our newly launched Patreon by viewers like you. Visit patreon.com forward slash homebrew happy hour and join our community. Thank you.